Welcome to the Stories or Soul Food podcast with your hosts, Brian Cole and best selling author, N.D. Wilson. This audio is brought to you by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. We are here for a special thing today. What have you? No, it's this is Stories or Soul Food hosting the legends of what have you. <laughs> or maybe we're hosting you. No, you're in my building. We'd have to be in a car to be hosting you all. But Next yeah. time, let's just try to do a takeover. Yeah. Welcome back to what have you. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. So here's a question. Are you guys releasing this as an episode of what have you? Yeah, because we okay. gave you our one slot there we go. for this recording. Is, we are, yeah. This is a co-hosted the episode. Mashup. Yep. yep. Co-hosted. This is like the Marvel comic book universe Whoa, at this point. You're right. Wow. We are bringing. This is what have you? Batman versus Superman. Food. Batman versus that's Superman. That's DC, oh, my sorry. friend, my and that's that's DC. <laughs> so how about what have you is soul food? That's, <laughs> that's what... <laughs> stories are what have you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it works in all directions. It does. Nice, but we do really have to do the names. And also, stories are soul. What have you? Actually, kind of works well too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there we go. Much depends yeah. on the story. So, for those of you who listen to stories of soul food. We are joined today by my sisters, Rebecca Merkel and Rachel Jankovic. Yep. Or Jankovic. Either one works. Both get, <laughs> Nate's, both get. Fle- Nate's flexible. <laughs> yeah, I'm flexible. And I've noticed that so are yeah, the we Yeah, are, we are also. We go by the Jenks anything. We'll answer to it. I don't really hear many people say Jankovic. Mm-mm. But they it is it. technically Jankovic, is it not? I don't know. We say Jankovic, but unless people, it's like our meter thing. They'll say the Jankovic family reunion or uh-huh. I'm a Jankovic. Mm. We okay. just say Jankovic in our little brain. Kamala, Kamala. Yeah, we do it all ways. <laughs> yeah, all the, all the ways. I was thinking, I was yeah. thinking, obviously the three of us, we've all known each other our whole lives. We've True. all known each other for all of Brian's life. Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. And we've known whichever one of us, ones of us were present. Since I was in for... the fifth grade and Becca was in the seventh grade and Rachel was in the third grade when Brian was born. Yep. Oh, do you remember that? Yeah, I was in his dad's class. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's pretty so exciting. we've all known Brian. And Brian's dad, Nate, taught both Nate and I fifth grade. Did you ever teach Brian? Oh, you missed but it. Ben I did. missed out. Did yes. Ben teach you? Yeah. Yep. I've, I've had yeah. Uh, much Hebrew from Mr. Merkel, <laughs> Dr. Merkel, I guess we say. Yeah. Doctor, call me doctor. <laughs> call me doctor. <laughs> uh, doctor Benjamin. Yeah, so we are joined on Stories Also Our Soul Food by my sisters, Rebecca Merkel, Rachel Jankovic, and we are joining them on what have you. <laughs> yes. I'm Nathan Wilson, Andy Wilson. This is Brian Cole. Yeah. We are both crashing what have you. We're going to talk about stories. We've today. really established how many of us are in the room There's now. There's four of us. We've covered it. <laughs> Voice recognition, that's Rachel talking. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If someone's laughing but not speaking, it's Becca. <laughs> Well, if you're someone's right. drinking, it's Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and next time, we're going to make you two come and sit in my back seat. Yeah, oh, yeah, for the actual yeah. what? So, we what, are we, what are we talking about today, Brian? Uh, we're talking about you know how to acquire books for your children. Mm. The home library, although that sounds this so feels like a terrible idea. You Who think came so? up with this topic? I, I <laughs> uh, me, I came up with this topic. <laughs> I love the idea of you asking this because I never answer people's questions about this because it's. <laughs> It would be much easier to just yeah. talk about it than to type out a little. So Rachel response. approves. We're doing it. We have a. We've moved and seconded. It's yeah, happening. Let's well, do it. I assumed it was already settled before I joined in, but no. Yeah, no. It's settled for sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how to acquire books? Yeah, I feel like it's a little bit like trophy hunting, and when you find a good one, you put it mm-hmm. on the wall, and and then everyone looks at it, and they want to know what books you have. That's my metaphor. Okay. So I used it right at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so, there we go. I will I will say that if you I do not like to deal with libraries because I felt like we would end up owing way too much money to a library. We just it couldn't deal with that in my life. So and also You know libraries are free. Yeah, but we would ruin and destroy books uh, that we lost. <laughs> and the other factor is if you don't know what anything about the book, it's like if you genuinely have no idea of the book, there's so much filth in kids' books. That it's like you do actually need to be researching what you'd be bringing home from the library. Although, anyway, if I could jump in there, I remember when we were kids, dad would 
on most Saturdays, he would take us out somewhere and it was often to the library and we were allowed to go look around through the books, but we always had to take them to him when we were little and he would preview it and he would say, now we're going to, you know, send that one back or yeah, you can check this one out or, yeah. or whatever. But it was a, a careful previewing when we were little because yeah. there is a lot of junk. But that was, I, I would say though, that Incredible the libraries Hulk. have gone <laughs> further and further down the tube. Yeah. Like when, oh, yeah. when we were kids, it was like, I don't, I mean, there was dumb books for kids but nothing like the just nothing open like propaganda now, yeah. as there is now <laughs> yeah. i feel like now if you took your kids to the library you're signing them up for a little evil preview of but i do things. think that back when we were kids it was the propaganda was there but it was sneakier which i think is why it was even wiser of dad to double check those yeah, things yeah. you know yeah, because it was, it was all there it was just not as in your face as yeah i mean now they've got the rainbow now. on the cover right. it was less, it was less obscene it was That's it was more sure. subversive right. now there's more obscenity in the mm -hmm. library yeah. and at the time there was just more rot yeah yeah, yeah back in the library it was all just kids hating on their parents mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to i yep. have two mommies sort yeah. of approach yeah and there i but it, the reason i was saying that is that my big advice if you have a well i have seven kids so when our oldest just started reading chapter books, I had that kind of like, okay, I should start accumulating some books. And then it was like, all of a sudden I had four kids who were voracious readers. And I was just like, well, I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. How do you buy enough books to keep up with this many children? And that is actually a lot of work to get enough books in your house for yeah. that many kids. It's not, I mean, for the kind of readers we wanted them to be, it's not like we want them each to own five books we wanted them to really yeah. have access to a lot more books than they could even yep. get through. And that actually takes a commitment to have things in your house. It's a, it is a bigger commitment than a lot of people want to make to their yeah. kids being good readers. It is also, I've had different phases in my life where I have a huge quantity of books just coming into my house by default. You know, so I would, it would take a lot of effort for me to stop the flow of books sort of like china <laughs> nowadays <Yeah. laughs> so there would be you know the the sales guys at random house loved my kids and so they would oh, load, right. they would load up huge boxes of every offering you know from the entire random house empire and those would show up on my doorstep and the kids would tear into those and find many amazing and wonderful things that these guys had sent and many things that we'd be like uh <laughs> Maybe we'll not, and th but then yeah. also the blurb stuff. So ARCs, like advanced readers mm -hmm. copies and galley copies would just show up. And so there were always stacks and stacks and stacks of books around. That's and, sort of a And it became problematic. It, yeah, it was lucky, but it also had downsides. So, you know, many, many times we have many war stories in our family of kids reading books ahead of schedule. Mm. Books that I would not have had them read. In fact, one of my... Uh, one of my teenagers, I now have four, uh, one of my younger teenagers just started a book and it's like, oh, well, I did an event. I was at an event with this author in, you know, back East and it was a big deal and they, you know, inscribed this book and it would have been rude for me not to take it when they gave mm -hmm. it. And it's this, you know, huge award-winning big shot novelist and I bring it home and there it is. And it's addressed to their father. And they look in there and on the title page, it's like somebody's inscribed this to their dad. <laughs> and so they start reading. <laughs> and oops. <laughs> and that's happened. I think one of the first books I burned, I actually just threw in the fire, was one of those where I was <laughs> at an author event where I had to sign a bunch of stuff and somebody else signed a book to me. And I was like, oh, thank you. But I was on my way to the airport and I tucked it into my, tucked it into my satchel and brought it home with me because I hadn't hit a trash can and I failed <laughs> to review it. And it was probably the worst book any of my children have ever read <laughs> as far as evil goes and horrible subversion and darkness. What kind so, of evil are we talking here? <laughs> oh, I mean, incest. No! <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, burning so, it was... Yeah, I mean, it's like the, the a memoir of an extremely damaged teenager yeah, uh, you know oh, horrible, oh, horrible oh man see. Or a horrible survivor's memoir Ugh. where anyway that kind of thing and you know the, it's anyway i just smiled that's not and what i recommend somebody. you have in your home library so, no, we, we have <laughs> yeah. but basically the thing the thing is so we've always had a kind of an odd situation and we've yeah. gotten a better grip on it 
but it's that's the case for everybody so it can feel like it's just more visible i get physical copies of books that just float through my mm -hmm. house and you know they arrive in the mail mm -hmm. and they sit there waiting for someone to look at them and i haven't looked at them yet and i've got a little vacuum cleaner of a child yeah you know who's reading that's happened a lot but that's not unique it feels unique to me or to authors but it's not if you have overdrive if you have library apps on your phone mm -hmm. if you have kindles if you have ibooks if you have any of that then all of the books in the entire world are there kind of floating floating by See here, I was feeling envious and with less visibility. There's no need for envy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but with, there's there's less visibility, so I can at least see. Like, wait, what? What are you reading, or what's going on? Yeah, uh, put that one back. No, that one's going in the fire. <laughs> <laughs> Do your kids overdrive, Rachel? Becca? No, Lena could. I guess our oldest has more access to other things. We have Kindles, but with restrict, they can't shop on their Kindles. They have what we put on the Kindles is on there. They don't. They're limited. Um. For our younger kids. But I think that having actual copies of books, this is a pet peeve of mine that I have with everyone wanting to be minimalistic, is that like I have a huge shelf full of craft books, which are not things I need and not say like they're kind of obscure, random, however I came into that. But I keep them because I actually love the like Saturday afternoon kid reading a book on some random thing that they but I don't want them drifting around the internet, checking right. if there's any interesting tidbits. Having hard copies of things for them to explore and learn in is actually really important to me that it not just be. And I was like, would it be nice to not have to have all of this stuff in my house? Yeah. Messing stuff up? Yeah. But is there a huge, ex what you were talking about, there's a real exchange of knowing what it is that they're looking at, knowing yeah. what. Like this is a thing. Well, that's it's, it's, visible. Shopping, it's visible to everybody. Like shopping in a limited amount. Mm -hmm. I mean, having enough that there's stuff for them to grab, but not having it be everything in the universe at your fingertips. I remember when I was a kid, that's like, I'd be bored. There's the bookshelf. You know, we'd go. Yeah. At, There's we'd, only those books, and, and we'd so you, loiter in the encyclopedias. Just yeah, being like, like wonder what's that's up. That's how in I here. ended up reading some obscure Kipling things or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, because you just like <laughs> yeah. pull it out, and it's like, well, I guess I'll read this then. Mm -hmm. And I think that yep. that's a really important thing. And sometimes books, like I would do a lot of thrift store book shopping. So I used to just routinely, when I would be at the grocery store, I'd stop at a thrift store that was by but near Walmart, Goodwill. And just run in and scan the shelves for different things I was looking at. And I would keep notes on my phone of series, like what numbers yeah. we didn't have in some See, series. I think that's what that's where we have to go. We have to get specific on the series. That will yeah. answer okay. all the questions. So one <laughs> one that I love is the Redwall books, which I love partly because it's like a square acre of reading. And there's so many of them. And it just goes, but not all of my kids have loved Redwall. And sometimes what you were talking about where they like, they have been avoiding it for some reason right. for a while. Yeah. And then one day comes where they're like, fine, I'll just read a red wall. And then, and then they're like gone for three weeks deep in the woods <laughs> yeah. of red wall, reading Moss all of these. Yeah. 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 And the thing, actually, this is a random aside because I just found this out and I loved it that I actually can't remember how to say his name. Jake's Ryan Jake's who wrote red wall yeah. that he was a milkman in England who delivered milk to a blind kid's school. And he wrote Redwall for the blind kids that he delivered milk to. That whole series is, and it, which actually makes sense because, you know, there's like the Redwall cookbook and it's really big on smells and flavors and, and stuff all yeah. through Redwall. But right. he was writing for blind kids, which I totally love that. Like, yeah, that's great. But not all my kids have jumped into those right away, but it's a ton of them. And sometimes they've come back. Yeah. And that's, and it is great. I actually find that I, frequently hand kids a uh, hard book you know we have a lot of graphic novels right now around or calvin and Hobbes is super easy to go to yeah. it's always i'm just going to read something and be amused but i'll always try to stretch them a little bit and mm -hmm. try to take the walls off of the genres you mm -hmm. know i was making my kids read raymond chandler uh fairly recently and uh, some of the older ones who are very surprised like they're very surprised by this world of you know noir yeah LA but just kind of like this is really interesting it's old enough that it's 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 very pg-13 you yeah. know it's not um thematically there's some there's some dark elements thematically but it's never gratuitously um 
descriptive. Right. Yeah. And yet the voice and the narration and the prose is all phenomenal. And we've starting in like fifth, sixth grade, we have fed the kids PG Woodhouse. Right. It's like oh, yeah. Yeah. massive quantities. And that's like important. Redwall. You got to yeah. get that in there. So Redwall is an example of something that's fun and there's a bunch, but it's also like it's a time passer. You're not rotting your brain. You're having fun. You're imagining stuff. But it doesn't stretch you or challenge you, depending on how old you are. Depending a on little your age, kid, yeah. yeah, a little kid could be stretched. But I've seen a, I've seen a lot of kids in larger homeschool families, uh, stunted. And mm. I've seen in like in reading families, I've seen a lot of them stunted, where they're still doing laps through little kid books. Mm -hmm. So what's the worst offender? Is that what happens if you read just Henty? Yeah, that sort of say, approach. Okay. Yeah, so Henty's super fun. That's a really really fun like junior high boy, especially thing and you can just kind of do laps i i read through the landmark series which was an old mm -hmm. uh, a lot of a very historical fiction I've, i found those all for my kids and nothing makes me happier than finding someone reading like combat nurses of world war ii <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the landmark series is like wild bill hickok yeah, yeah. it's just everything uh, you know Tra these fur trappers yeah. There was one book called Midshipman Lee at the Naval Academy. I remember that. I, that. I did a lot of laps through that one. Nice. I like that one. I did Hunters Blaze the Trails over and over. Which, <laughs> but then I, the more I learned about them, the less I realized the truth was. In that book. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's one of those things where when I meet a, a college freshman, a high school senior who's really into Henty, that is sad. It's just sad, and it's like you know that was great food, good job, well done, you back then grow okay so so for the metaphor that's because it's it's like meeting an adult whose favorite food is fish fingers that sort of yeah. thing is that mm -hmm. sort of what you're going with yeah and i have nothing wrong with fish fingers and there's nothing wrong with there's yeah there's nothing wrong with it but there are people who decide to never grow in their taste or sophistication but i would say i would say that this goes two ways because if you're not discerning with the things they start with graduating higher and higher will just get worse and worse you know yeah. Hundred percent. There's no. There's no question. But we've talked about. We've talked about the. You know. You. You don't want them to ever just be a vacuum cleaner. Like even though they're they're in right. more mm -hmm. of a vacuum cleaner, baby bird phase, they have to be able to engage with what's true or false or good or bad about what they're reading, <laughs> and their tolerances for what's good and bad, uh, will increase and should increase. Mm -hmm. So their sophistication. So they could be very early. They're just saying so and so had a bad attitude. You know, like moss flower was rude to someone. <laughs> um, and, then, and then you go, you, you keep dialing it up and you're like, man, this Raymond Chandler stuff, by the time I'm 15 or 14 and I'm reading The Big Sleep, like you're, there's more to process. There's moral right. dilemma, you know, moral dilemmas and things to process. But you're, it goes wrong the other way. Most of the culture and most of our culture, people are encountering too much darkness too young. And then, and then not not having anyone to guide them, yeah. and talk through it, because I think that's the thing of just letting them read and the parents have no idea what they're reading and they don't teach them how to engage with it or so they're encountering darkness. And or the then, parents don't know what they think. Of yeah. It. Right. So. Or could it, side note real quick. Parents are quite hypocritical about it, where the parents and their own entertainment standards, they're not engaging with the darkness. They just consume more of it because right. they think i'm an adult so now i consume more bad stuff in my own personal netflix show or yeah. whatever my favorite show is i consume more darkness and so i'm okay with them consuming progressively more and more darkness as opposed to engaging and resisting and pushing yeah, back totally but anyway well becca you along those lines isn't that what you teach the kids to do in classical lit for example because i've yeah. heard you know <laughs> having their having yes. their <laughs> Haven't there big, been huge flame fires at Logos over Ovid, for example? Yeah, Ovid is one that I think is fantastic for that exact thing, where you do have, by the time we're most of the way through, well, and we do the metamorphoses, we're not, that's the one of right, Ovid, I right. should clarify. Yeah, Logos. not ours on the Not just every um, Ovid. Not all of Ovid, but, but it, that one is like where everybody's about three quarters of the way through it and they just look a bit ill and they're sort of like, why are we reading this? Or having to explain to yeah. parents, and you know, like, juniors. why this are you juniors, reading right? this? Yeah, juniors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 16 and 17 year olds. Yeah. And yeah, it is trying to, yeah, walk through it carefully. How do you think about this like a Christian? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, because you would say, I mean, well, what did you say when, when that came up as, why are we reading this? 
Like, why do you read Ovid? Something that's well, so full of, you know, well, there is some incest in Ovid. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> there the is. Old Testament. There yeah, is. Exactly. Well, that's the thing is there's nothing in Ovid that is more, um, it's not like it's pornographic. There's dark stuff, but it's dark like the book of Judges can be dark. It's just that it isn't the Bible and it's written by pagans. And so you do have people with like, why on earth are we wading through this? And then, of course, there's the classic answers about, you know, all of Christian lit is really built on knowing the classics. If you want to understand Milton or you want to understand Spencer, you really have to have read the classics first. There's that stuff. But I think I do get a lot of students who have come into classical lit having read Percy Jackson or they've read, what's that, Darlay, Dallaire's book? Oh, yeah. It's that big yellow one. And so they come into class thinking, I really love mythology. They know yeah. how. Yeah. They yeah. know Such a how. Bad big yeah. fan. And big so fan of mythology. Yeah. Basically, love those Greek gods. I just think fab. <laughs> if you just let your kids do the little fairy tale versions of the myths and they think it sounds so fun and it's all like, golden arcadia and there's monsters and and it's all fabulous foot things yeah it's all and, foot races for golden apples and the <laughs> thing is i think if you just let your kids do that kind of mythology it's like only showing them the fun side of cocaine addiction because it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like and, and we can all speak to the fact there is a fun side <laughs> <laughs> well the thing is is that like this is idolatry and it's dark and these people were in bondage and it really is heavy. Like These are the it's demons heavy. that ruled over exactly. mankind for mm -hmm. quite so, a while. So they come in thinking like, oh, I love mythology. And then they start <laughs> encountering actual mythology. And it's like, you really have to reckon with what idolatry and paganism really was like. And I think that's hugely healthy for the students to have to, so to my, see So my son, my oldest, because he's uh, not normal. And he's currently, currently studying <laughs> uh, Nez Perce. I know. And so I know, on, it's amazing. on the Sabbath, he was over there grinding away in this like 3,000 page Nez Perce dictionary. And I was saying, Rory, is this rest? And he was like, yes. <laughs> it is. <laughs> this is not my schoolwork. I'm doing this for fun. Mm -hmm. So he's been reading legends, Nez Perce legends in okay. the native language. Yeah. All right. Okay, I read and, a few of those. And it's kind of funny because. He, he's really enjoying reading them in the actual language, but okay. also did not do that. <laughs> but, but he's Time also. Out, Ryan. Yeah. But, but the other thing that's hilarious is how they're exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly the same yeah. kind of story. Oh, okay. Right. Like there's actually, I mean, there's differences of personality and stuff, but it's as a story starts, you know, you if you've been in any fairy tale, any myth that's not Disneyfied, right? Mm -hmm. if exactly. You, if you remove the Disneyfication of mythology mm -hmm. and you've read german fairy tales and you've right. read persian that was always or, a real downer when yeah. you did that as a kid you're, you're like, like oh grimm's fairy tales i should read <laughs> oh, one they of those chopped her toes I, love, off. I love stories about people <laughs> oh, who lose their feet that's um, really weird <laughs> dismembered you know, wives and yeah boxes. which is eating children <laughs> yeah. which is eating children and the bodies in the in the boxes and <laughs> right so then you you read nez Perce stories and it's kind of like this is out of ovid now was yeah. rory's big comment is these stories, these tribal stories, are straight out of Ovid. They were dealing with the same kinds of, I mean, weird psyche, mythical psyche yeah. that that exists yeah. elsewhere. The darkness is similar, with different different props and settings. I do want to say something here because I think that this is maybe the foundation of what we we're talking about. How you want your kids to grow up in some things, you don't want to be overly protective, and you want to be protective enough that they're learning it. Yeah. And you, and you want them to, to have a it. habit of talking to you about it. Yes. You want them in the habit of engaging. I feel like this is time for me to vent about an issue that upsets me every time, but it comes up pretty often because I'm obviously involved in the Bible reading challenge. How often Christian women ask other women what it's safe to let your children hear from scripture. Yep. And that I think is the baseline that you have to accept that all of scripture is appropriate for every human. Like that this is okay. It doesn't mean that Which when I read a Bible more, story, we're far more Victorian than we realize way more. We're totally trying to put skirts on the piano legs of scripture to keep our kids from, you know, like really weird. That's a weird reference. You should explain that. The Victorians did that. They were yes. so concerned about sexual illusions of table legs, legs? and piano legs. Oh, legs. They, so the leg they put has a leg. It has them. a leg, so legs are inappropriate. They would put skirts on them to keep everyone from getting lewd. And, uh, <laughs> but 
There, but <laughs> those I, sofas. <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, while having horrific syphilis problems, so yeah. they were really not nearly as holy as they may go hand in hand. They do. If you're, totally if you're stressed out about a table. You're light, lascivious to the core yeah. at that point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but my point is, everybody thinks we're being safety patrol officers. When if you're actually trying to be like, oh, this isn't okay for my children to hear. There's a lot of stuff that we've explained to our kids at an age appropriate level because they yeah. met it in well, scripture. Speaking because they're of, like of your father's yeah, fifth, fifth grade, grade class. That one brought a Notes lot of to conversations. Parents, up. Talk about the birds and the bees. They're, they're reading through Genesis. Yeah. Right. And so then they do come home with some questions and you're like, oh. Did you read that? <laughs> that, is well, in, right. that is in the inspired word of God. It <laughs> yeah. Is. yeah. <laughs> and then you do have to have those conversations, but I do think it's... Or your kid's just like, what's harlotry? <laughs> and you're like, well... It's a metaphor. Uh, <laughs> harlotry <laughs> is dot, dot, dot. Like you just have... But but the reality is we just we just made a commitment as a family. We would never flinch from anything that was in scripture. We're not hiding them. We're not being deep. like, guys, right. we're going to do a deep study on Lot's daughters right now. <laughs> right. We didn't do that, but we didn't hide it from them and we never protected them from it. Just like in the sermons that they sit and listen to, right. there will be references about pornography and things well before they have any concept of what yeah, that even right. is. I had a, at a, oh, what com I think it was a big GHC conference. I think so. Talking to a couple of moms afterwards who, after I gave one of these stories or soul food talks about how you have to calibrate your kids with scripture mm -hmm. and they, you know, build up their, their muscles, their narrative muscles and their resistance and their maturity with scripture mm -hmm. and Bible stories. A couple of moms told me afterward that they have strictly forbidden their children from reading the Old Testament. The Old Testament is off limits oh. and their kids get in trouble oh. for oh, no. it. And I... My response was less than cool. Hmm. Um, I, I, I think my I exact think words were, who do you think you are? Amen. Like, uh, how dare you? And it's like, you're, you're now as bad as any tyrant in the Reformation yeah, trying, trying to keep true. God's word, word from people. No, you may not have it in English. And <laughs> you also, may not read and it also in English. you're totally being a nasty pope yourself yeah. because no doubt your own standards are not that pure. You're only applying this in one weird place. My children, children may not read the Old Testament. I, however, throw Breaking Bad parties. Yeah, I love with it. My friends. It's really edifying. <laughs> it's really edifying for me. Yeah, that, that's not necessarily the case for those mothers. No. They were actually in over shelter mode. Yeah. So they had, you know, they teenagers think the who sin were. sin doesn't come from within us. <laughs> right. But they, yeah. they, they well, were. It's like panic, right? Because it was too, yeah. too late. Yep. And so it's panic and things are going bad. And so I, I can't tell you how many parents I've talked to who said we only allow G rated. You know, we only allow G-rated films and you have 16 year olds. You know, it's like that is, they have mm. to get their sea legs under them. They have to actually. It is like basically saying my firm approach is to never teach my children to swim because I know that when they mm -hmm. are 18 mm -hmm. to 20, they're going to be out in the ocean by themselves. So what <laughs> I'm going to do is never no teach them. No swimming skills. Water is yeah. scary. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I want totally. it to take them by surprise completely. <laughs> but I do think. I do. <laughs> I do think one of the things that that uh, is important about this, though, is that there's a genre of kids lit, which is what you were saying. Redwall is, which I agree. I think Redwall is this, which is basically just roughage. It's basically like yeah. you're reading. You just need more stuff to read. It's read the more giant stuff. bag of baby carrots that totally. you're allowed to hit between Eat meals. It. <laughs> Eat it, guys. Go for it. Have it. Yeah. Eat it. And, uh, but there's actually not enough great literature for children to not also have roughage in yeah, your, you in your home. And yeah. so we would, I had things, I have things around the but house think, that think are not that. It's okay. It is okay to have Christmas dinner and have books that are like that. And have box mac sometimes. Yeah, to have yeah. box mac mm -hmm. and it's okay to have a lot of grilled cheese in your childhood and PB&Js. Totally. And then to still have birthday dinners, Christmas dinners, mm -hmm. Sabbath dinners, things like that where. No, it's not all equal. So I, yeah, there's a lot of just rough. But and the contrast say, is hugely important too, though, because yeah. if you if you raise the kid like you were saying, fish fingers is their ultimate standard of cuisine. That's sad. But if you had somebody who can't ever have anything that's not Christmas dinner, you've just raised the snob. Yeah. So it's like actually having. I the have. Full I have loved really when my great. kids come to me with a book, and I'm trying to think of which one this happened with, but it was something. It was really funny to me because it was like a kid who was probably deep in the throes of like 
reading the Hardy Boys and, you know, reading that yeah. kind of thing. And then they were reading, I think it was maybe Woodhouse. But them coming to me like, Mom, this guy writes really well. Like, oh, yeah. like where they could tell from their own experience that yeah. this is a far better, this yeah. is superior. There's some, there's some flavor here. We yeah. had a, a similar thing that cracked me up because it was, it was an acquaintance who had written a book, had given a copy book. So it had come into our home that mm -hmm. way. And uh, it was Judah was young. Like, I don't know, he was probably fourth grade maybe or something. And he picked it up and was reading it. And I said, oh, how is that? Well, and he, did, he didn't know who the author was, anything. Yeah. He was like, I feel like he's never written a story before. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I, bet, I bet some and kids give brutal to know reviews. That, that was the case. So. so I felt like it was. It was amazing. Like, oh, so amazing. Uh -huh. But what I was going to say is next <laughs> in the genre of crazy roughage that you're buying, I do think parents need to be attentive to that. Like, for instance, one example I can remember is when Lena, our oldest, was when I was noticing we didn't have enough books. I bought a box set of Angelina Ballerinas at the Costco because I was like, well, here's a bunch of books she can look at. And then we threw them away one by one as I was going to, as I was going to read them to her. I was like, what the heck is this horrible story? Like, <laughs> and they really were, but I think we ended up with like out of the whole box set keeping like maybe three of them that were in different levels of. So horrible. Why? Because we're not in shelter mode for Angelina Ballerina, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I am. Bullet. No, here's the thing. She's a nasty, nasty little selfish mouse but the story <laughs> the story presents her as clearly the person you're supposed to identify with with no criticisms of her very okay. evil selfishness so like the one i mean i can remember one of them we got to she finds out she's gonna have a brother or sister and she's so mad that she's or her mom's pregnant i suppose and she's locked in her room like and it's a picture of her holding the door shut while her parents are like pleading <laughs> with her from the outside she throws a lamp in her like anger about having a sibling but the resolution is everyone assuring her that she's the most she's important. still their favorite child right now you know you're still our dearly beloved princess who's magnificent there's no comment on it was like her poor feelings had to be you know i was just like this is not even worth the pet like this is not worth having in the house from like this is just stupid or later there's one where she wants to be the star of the ballet show and someone else gets the part and she's super mad Happened about to that. to the best of us. Yeah, yeah, but it goes on. It wasn't quite a Tanya Harding story, but it oh, no. basically amounts to the resolu resolution. Angelina Tanya Harding. Yeah, exactly. But the resolution is that the person who was supposed to be the star of the show sprains her ankle. So good news. Angelina gets no. to be the star of the show. And, and the, it, to me, it was like the author does not understand anything about <laughs> goodness or be, like i just was like no but Neither clearly like angelina gets the swat well that's what i actually i actually remember that being lena's commentary where we're like reading along and i turn the page and i'm like well and she's like she needs some spanking and i'm like mm -hmm. and we see that's an example of a kid engaging actually yes, at that level but because of the nature mm -hmm. what i'm trying to say is because the nature of those books was not something i intended to be walking through with them it was right. supposed to be pictures for them to look at and things yeah. for them to do i'm like this is not worth having this kind right. of insidious garbage in the house uh, well we you know that's all i meant is that each phase yeah. there's the right. there's the kind of roughage but you have to be loosely aware of what so if we're going to talk about good series to have around your house if you have a bunch of kids then i would say one of the challenges is as parents you have to be readers yourself and even mm -hmm. if you're in a busy busy place where you're not reading as much as you once did you need to have read you need to have taste you need to kind of be able to set mm -hmm. mile markers of growth for your kids but red wall is a great series to have around it's a, it is a really mm -hmm. great and there's so many you know there, there's a lot there's One a lot of stuff lloyd alexander i felt like should always be around i have a lot of him in my house yeah a lot of lloyd alexander I, I actually found enid blyton from enid blyton was a prolific english author that's a ton of stuff it's like nancy drew level but she's more clever i think by like reading yeah. level and we have a bunch of her series she was so prolific that it's like we have the famous five the secret seven yep. the adventure books 
the I think there's one that's the magic faraway tree house that we have. And yeah. We, so I probably uh, we probably have like 60 Enid Blyton. Yeah, we books. kind of discovered the famous five first because we we're living in England and then they were readily available. Mm-hmm. And here they're harder to come by. But right. The we famous those. five mm-hmm. and then um, Swallows and Amazons was another yeah. mm-hmm. one that we found when we were there. Aside from obviously yeah. Narnia, I mean, yeah, right. gotta have and Narnia, Narnia for me, that's like the Christmas dinner stuff where right. it's like, okay, Narnia is fantastic. It's okay to read Lloyd Alexander and have it not be Tolkien or Lewis, mm-hmm. but it will remind you of aspects of them and it will have moments of wisdom and mm-hmm. moments of like, mm-hmm. eh, yeah, you know, Susan um, Cooper has some things like that. Right? We yeah. like the, you should always have Tintin. Is it Edward yes. Eager, the magic ones or the, yeah, magic those by the are, lake. Those are fun. That series is really fun. So that is a series that I, my kids enjoyed them so much that I, what you were saying, I'm like, I have a lot going on, but I did stop to read a couple of those to see what is yeah. this about. And this other series that I listened to is my kid, my older kids read The the Thief by yep. Megan, Megan Whalen Turner. Turner. Yeah. Yep. So that series I listened to because I knew my kids and because they were like, this is really good. Yeah. And I wanted to know if I agreed with them that it was really good, like that they'd read something yeah. I had no knowledge of. And I did agree with them that I thought it was really good. And there was plenty to talk about in the no, book. There's plenty of things. What is yeah. what is going on here? What's the author doing? Do you think that's right? What's the first book? Oh, over. I think it's The Thief, but oh, yeah. it goes, yeah. there's a lot of them. The Queen of Atolia. Queen and, of Atolia. Then the, yeah. And, but it, they, they, different, they struggle differently. They have different. Yeah. But my, different issues. my point is, I, I I'm love happy having to my, have yeah. the kids read them and yep. we talk about those. And I we love having and, my kids have opinions about which one's the best and why and which characters are weaker. Right. Or, yeah, totally. And yeah. what, and what was, what is so well done about this and what is, why do you like it and what's going on? So yeah. I, that's a series that I read because my kids liked it first that I was like, all right, I'll catch up yep. with you. And Tintin. You said Tintin. Tintin. I uh-huh. stacks just of Tintin around. had stacks of those. Yeah. It was in multiple formats. I feel like we had yeah. some of the hardback that had a bunch of them in yeah, it. The and then just a the little one. I have somebody in my family who would prefer, he's in that age range where he would prefer to just be reading Calvin and Hobbes or Tintin or right. Asterix that's or my, Far Side or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that age range. And and I and I don't mind it. I just don't want it to stop there. So I'm yeah, like, right. I love that you like this, but you can't totally. just kind of be at the end of yep. what you do, which is so for Christmas, I bought some of the elite literature. It was called like extreme adventures. Right. It's we like did the great. crocodile or the scorpion. <laughs> we and the did something. great battles for boys. That's yeah, the one oh, we did. Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, but it it's totally barely a step up from like it's yeah. it's. And the funny thing is, I it really I love it when you're like you feel like you're laying a trap and then you see the child off pouring over their extreme scorpion adventure <laughs> and you're like yes Got we have done it we have done the thing now uh, but chapter a big part books, of it yeah. they have to learn that they can get through a chapter book in not very much time like they just have yeah, to, it's like right. something that can be kind of it sounds like more work than they feel like doing or whatever um so some of those are not, I feel like we have some, oh, Enid Blyton, we also have mystery ones of hers, which are more like mystery We're series. jumping age range, but Enid has, but, or jumping yeah. around, all of us are, but. Yeah. I have a, my kids. My kids just started. So started going through a lot of Agatha Christie's and. Oh yeah, we have a lot yeah. of those. And my older kids have all done laps through P.D. James. Yeah. Which is, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're heavier. Mm-hmm. You know, it's darker because you're like, it's crime, it's dark crime and. Yeah. But, um. Well, I think, she's, I think my, I have one teenager, a 16 year old who's done all of P.D. James at this point. Well, P.D. James is so biblically literate, even yeah. though she's not. The only P.D. James, or no, maybe things, I've read but, two of them. The first one that I read of hers, I thought was a whole lot of nothing. So I haven't been inspired to buy more which, of which them. Which one? Oh, uh, I feel like it has sin in the title. It was recommended to me from someone, It was, but it was a very gay crime and uh, you sure. know it was a, it was just gnarlier yeah. than i want to be like yeah. hey teenagers why don't you all dive in same girl I f- she was reading bride's head revisited oh, <laughs> and man. i was like eh, how about <laughs> yeah. I, and and that's just it's not um i still remember was, that yeah. was more just that's I just still so remember despairing dad so being sad. like rachel are you reading gone with the wind and i was like yes i am and he was like why like having this discussion <laughs> and whenever it was i was like I just felt like I needed to know what happens in Gone with the Wind. And he was just like, carry on, you know? <laughs> but I just remember this, like, I felt like I should have known this by now, so I'm going to read it. And, <laughs> and I did. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I, we're probably getting close to the end, but I thought one question might be, you, you've been talking in terms of teaching someone to swim or teaching someone to have taste. What is the goal for a reader? It might be helpful to loop back around. Like, what do you want out of your children? Obviously, I've got A and under, but looking forward, we've been talking in some older books, some of the older teen years. What do you want your kids to be doing based on what they're reading? What are you training them for? I think I'm going to end up misquoting this. But it was Lewis who said that literature exists to teach what is useful to, you know, you know, the quote that yeah. I'm talking about to, to some, delight, to delight in the, mm, I'm going to pull it up. You guys keep talking. I'm, I'm going to quote Sydney while you look up Lewis is poesy is the art of imitation, like- et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> For so Aristotle term it in the word mimesis. Hold on guys. Sorry. Representing counterfeiting and figuring <laughs> forth. The speaking metaphorically, a, a speaking park. picture. With this end, to teach and delight. And I okay, think that yeah. that's the piece that to both teach and delight because you have like the Oscar Wilde and the aesthetic movement where it is not to teach, it is only to delight, end of story. And I think that is such a dead end. And then if you have only teaching, it's dry and difficult and, you know, nobody's that interested. So I feel like to teach and delight is kind of, the key i and think those two the, things have the, to go the together food, that's just the food metaphor again because what's food for like well why did god make food the way he did it's like we are trying we, t- we try to take pleasure in it it but should, also it should it's, delight it keeps and to you sustain. alive right yeah and, to edify to sustain to so, strengthen but also yeah it shouldn't just be protein soup no yeah. and i just like you want the kids to be delighted enough to pursue it but you want them to be taught so that they can go out into the world equipped to handle it like the characters in the stories handled it, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I found the quote literature exists to teach what is useful, to honor what deserves honor, to appreciate what is delightful. The useful, honorable and delightful things are superior to it. It exists for their sake. Its own use, honor or delightfulness is derivative from theirs. And I would say that you want your kids to have a palette for what's honorable and yep. what's delightful and what's true and what's yep. whatever. And, um, we, we were talking about one other author that I do have all of, like, I have Beverly Cleary. Yeah. And that one, the thing with Beverly Cleary is I don't agree with her on a lot of, like, when she makes characters are kind of fighty with each other. Now, it's like things that I wouldn't want my own children yeah. doing or behaving like that. Or, um, like, Dear Mr. Henshaw is a really sad, sad book about a boy whose father has left him. And it's a very, it's a really sad book. But I've actually loved having every one of my early readers read those because it troubles them. Like, because they actually are kind of like, this is heavy. Like, this. And so I have always used that as a time to talk with them about how their own life is so safe. But many children, kids that you see at the park are living in worse situations than that. You know, like broadening their own understanding of what's going on in the world. It does actually heighten their own love of being in fellowship, being in a, like it, it heightens things that we want them to be aware of. Yeah. That's good. I, d- I feel the same way about James and the giant peach. Uh, okay. I Just do be not grateful that you like, didn't roll away in a peach. I do not like, <laughs> I, rolled doll gives me the creepers. Just, I actually like some of his stuff and not some of his other stuff, but I, I do like rolled doll. I feel sinister about him. Like Alice, well, Alice he was, in Wonderland. He was a miserable person to be around. Really? Yeah. If, feels like the creepiness of Alice in Wonderland to me. Like that, like something is not right here and I don't like oh, to think I've about never, it. I've never heard that, but... Uh, I'm not accusing him of that. Oh, okay. I'm saying something's not right but somewhere in there. And Alice in Wonderland in is there. still pretty phenomenal. Despite. No doubt. I just have a low tolerance for yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah. So I guess the question is not, you know, people can be focused on what do I need this book to do? But the question is, what does your kid need to be stronger at? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. feed that. I want to add one thing. genre that we should have mentioned because we all grew up on it and our grandfather continues to nonstop hand him out. I think been here before. Out. Has he? Yeah, have you do said it. Missionary biographies, stories of saints before. Yeah. Those are, gr- that is great roughage material because even when it's like, yeah, we don't agree with that person's theology or we don't agree or with this. Or it's not great literature. Or it's right. downright yeah. poor literature in other cases. It doesn't matter because that in that category of teaching what's useful and honoring what's honorable, it does those things. It teaches your kids to. Yeah. Win. And just the, yeah. the category of being someone who's willing, who might have to die for what you believe is, is a great one for little guys, my yep. little guys to realize, oh, wait, mm-hmm. they, they died. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah. especially right now, there's so many people that are ready to phone in everything they ever thought, just as long as they're safe. Yeah. And so having your you, kids grow up on stories where bravery and sacrifice are a thing matters. Yep. And where they honor that, like they honor the fact that people loyalty to yeah. something outside your own personal comfort is mm -hmm. worth something. Yeah. 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 Your whole family feels like it's worth something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember I have, I have a lot of experiences with reading a book that I really loved and then binging on the rest of that author's work and finding out like, oh, that was horrible. <laughs> you know, yeah. H. Ryder Haggard. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I love King Solomon's oh, Lines. Yeah. And so now I'm going to read She. Oh, and yeah. The return of She. <laughs> like, what on earth oh, is this oh, nonsense? Uh, oh, I did that. Speaking of that, Bucken. You should have Bucken. Oh, yeah, Bucken, Bucken yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Bucken. Bucken's good absolutely. to have on the shelves for the times when people are bored. You know, that actually is a great mm -hmm. reminder because I need to, I should throw those at some of my children right now. Yeah. They're fantastic. They yeah, are really make good. Make sure that I have all those. Soul food being cooked right now. Yeah. In, yeah. In Nate's mind. 39 yeah. steps. Green Mantle. Green There's Mantle a, is, um, is Mr. just Stanfast. Mr. Stanfast. But Green those Mantle so is, I think. Uh, Prester John, right? Yep. But yeah. Green Mantle is, is where he peaks, I think. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Is that eight-year-old level? Can no. I read that no. out? You can read it aloud. You can read it aloud. It's okay. a total thriller. 39 I mean, steps kids... you can read aloud and okay. see how your eight-year-old yeah. handles it. Awesome. But it's definitely not a uh, here. Right. You'll understand the First World War all by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you'll totally, you'll totally understand He's still this. into, so the Spanish-American War, where did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is In when. Spain or America? I right, have exactly. one who was really into military things also, but we bought yeah. him like a map of the battles of the of War for Independence, you know, and he would pour over that forever. This is the same person who's deeply committed to Calvin and Hobbes and nothing else. So you really wonder what's going <laughs> on in there. Visual learner. Well, well, just what, just what interests you is what. Yeah. Looking at stuff. Yeah, yeah. Kind of a, yeah. Well, <laughs> he does read also, you know. Yeah, I'm just saying maps and Calvin and Hobbes. What do they have in common? Yeah. Okay. My kids have also liked <laughs> the uh, mysterious Benedict Society. Yeah. They've enjoyed yeah, like that. that. And those are some big ones. Mm-hmm. A number of I'm trying to think of series because that's the thing that's so relieving right. to find out about series. Well, obviously, I mean Nate's stuff. Nate's stuff. <laughs> yeah. oh, Read all of my books. I <laughs> do I do actually want to say this. Nate's books are a great example of books that get this treatment in our house. When you're buying books for your kids, if you actually want your kids to read books and you want your kids to love reading books, don't be uptight and shrill about your kids reading books. Like if they take a book to sit in a tree and read it. They bring it in the car and then they drop it and someone steps on it. The cover gets ripped off. Deal with it. It's they're consuming yeah. the literature. And I, I think that that is where many parents go really wrong is being so uptight about that, like $10 investment that acting yeah. like the book itself is why you have it mm. when it's actually the kids learning things from it. So with your books, I buy them all the time. Whenever I see extra ones, I buy them. <laughs> we probably have like 35 of them all <laughs> in various phases of disrepute because they're all, they just get thrashed and read and left here and left there. And then eventually I throw them away when I'm like, well, this is too beat up now. Moving on. It is, it is funny. I get, I get rebuked often by moms for not having written enough books. And I feel like as I finish my 13th novel. Like, I have I not done my part? Like, come on. I mean, that's a lot of novels. After 13, you can start over again. It's okay. Like, a, as a reader. Yeah. Do it You lap. can start again. <laughs> yeah, right. I would say yeah. Narnia is another one that we have. We probably have like five complete sets of, at least, of the Narnia books. And everybody books, should and I just have let read them go. Narnia a lot, 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 lot of times by the right. time they're done with their childhood. So, yeah. I feel like that's one that needs to and stay the just audio, in circulation. On those things, I think the audio, it's great to start kids on the audio so long as, because we actually enjoyed the focus on the family audio versions of Narnia before they read it because it leaves yeah. just enough out that when they read the book, they're like, this is way better than the, like they, they notice yeah. that they were, but they love it. The yep. basics are there in the audio, but when they read the books themselves, they're like vastly also superior. something. Uh, I mean, you can listen to the dramatized versions of Narnia Chronicles without going crazy on a road trip, but. Only so much Adventures in Odyssey before. <laughs> yeah. Before I don't want to hear more I Adventures in Odyssey. I can't take an Adventures in Odyssey. Oh, oh really? And I, I, James I enjoy Harriet. Them, but... James oh. Harriet is. <laughs> We've done Clive Cussler, honestly. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. But James Harriet is a good. Once, that's once. a good one for tons of kids' books, yeah. also. Okay, yeah. But also, yeah, it's Harriet. fun and audio. Yeah. Yeah. We like those. I did uh, Amazing Tales for Making Men Out of Boys. 
huh. which was which is a pretty good. I bought one. that off of your recommend. Okay, I, I, it was great. It was it was much harder than I thought it was going to be, but uh, man, the stories are good, and it's fun because you can buy the Wikipedia versions of those where the author just wrote basically based off Wikipedia, or you can write a real author writing about them, and the two are very different. <laughs> <laughs> the two, the two are different. So we've been told to list all the titles that we mentioned in our show notes. I don't okay. know how on Good earth that's possible for this one. We're going to do it though, because I don't know that we can for this one. You don't think we can? There's too many. I mean, you can try. I'm not going to try. Let's just see how many authors we can mention real fast now. <laughs> Quick, go, you go, 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 the go. bad list, all the ones we give. The baddies. No, no stars on Yelp. For no those. stars this, for the mouse dancer. A- <laughs> mouse dancer. ballerina. Whichever corrupt. Takes it in the teeth. The corrupt, <laughs> the corrupt mouse. We don't, we don't like her. Speaking of mice, E.B. White. Oh, uh, yeah. You oh. know. Oh, Stuart Little. We read Stuart Little aloud and wait. Yes, it was Stuart Little. We read it aloud and couldn't believe what a little turkey he is throughout <laughs> it. <laughs> and, and it's funny because I had not a recollection of that as a child. Well, I think I, people mix up Ralph S. Mouse and yeah. Stuart uh, Little and true. then. Yeah, the Ralph S. Mouse is uh, Cleary. That's Cleary, Beverly Cleary. Cleary. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the what's which Hank one's got the, the motorcycle cow dog? and the ping-pong? Uh, we love helmet. Hank the cow Hank dog. Hank the cow dog Ralph, Ralph is fun. Yeah, Ralph you guys Mouse listen, is the you one listen I like. to Hank the cow dog, don't you? Uh, I don't know that <gasps> we started. You I think know, we have to. There's a whole uh, there are Hank the cow dogs read by the author. By the author and they're so and funny. They're so okay. funny and right. my little boys deeply love Hank okay, the we'll cow dog. It. Yeah. Write it down. And I actually at least this title. And actually Hank the cow dog is in fact one that as a parent you find yourself sniggering along when you're listening. You know, you're hearing yeah. them listen to it but it's cracking you up yeah. also because it is well done. And then I feel like Patrick McManus people mm, should be okay, introduced great. to. Yes. He's so Patrick <laughs> McManus for me is a counterpoint to PG Woodhouse. Yeah. You're yeah. reading for character work and hilarious yep. prose yep. and but he unlike Woodhouse he goes far more with action comedy. Yeah. 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 He does some yeah. amazing impressionistic nothing. descriptions of <laughs> <Yeah>. action sequences. <laughs> nothing, nothing oh. will ever like the, uh, the first deer. Yeah. The first yeah. deer yeah. Yeah. Is so bike with the deer coming <laughs> alive on the back of his bike. <laughs> and pedaling so down the next. <laughs> yeah. Oh my that God. Is, yeah, that is Patrick one of Green the best. has some pretty fantastic When I was a books. kid, major roughage was Jim Keelgard dog stories. You know, I think mm-hmm. they're, no, oh, I don't know that. Those? Okay, well, he wrote a ton of dog stories, and <laughs> okay. uh, I hope now that they're not way worse than my <laughs> yeah, fourth grade self remembers. Remember. But For I mean, he fought the dog, fought the coyote, so I don't know what more you'd want. Well, yeah. What about Booth Tarkington? That's a oh, throwback. Because actually, that's good because I was going to mention this to you, Brian. In terms not of things PC. out of yeah, things out of copyright. Yeah, some Penrod. Okay. Penrod and Sam is not politically correct, but there are just some genius moments yeah. in there. Lena recently read Penrod it and, and it has led Penrod to her often Sam. saying, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> 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 There's just some great stuff in there. Yeah, awesome. Penrod. Yeah. And given that it probably is out of copyright, I think we should do some additions. Okay. Yeah, anyway, we should print good. some additions of those. Do we need to mess with any of the things that are super not PC? No, and- probably. Yeah. Yeah. But it's- yeah. Some of them are significant, I think. We could just take out the racisms. <laughs> right. Let's take out all racism. No need to read that just because it's in a good book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, we'll see. It, it will still be uh, politically incorrect. Oh, I love those. I love But those are fantastic books. Around the dinner table. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My older kids have all read Peace Like a River. That's an yes. example of one that they all love it, but it's not a super light weight yep. book but okay. they love Everything. it but when wow. they read other leaf angers we've had a lot of conversation about why are his other books just nowhere near as good as at, i don't believe they are but my kids don't either you know like peace like a river i think it's the story is so compelling and his writing is as good in other books but the but it yeah falls flat somehow but that's been a thing that with my teenagers we'll talk about that kind of thing but I, i'm just trying to stay educated to keep up with them yeah. in the lit conversations not easy, actually. So what was I going to give my kids when I get home? Bucking. Yep. Yeah, it was bucking. Do some bucking. Yeah. And I'm going to hand one kid the big sleep. There's one author that I like, uh, Elizabeth Marie Pope. That's like a younger girl's, not, I mean, probably like fourth, fifth grade, somewhere in there, that age range. She only wrote two books, the Sherwood Ring and the Perilous Guard, those two. Hmm. But they're both, good and they're also i think why i like them so much is that they're not at all culturally hip like they are not cool in a lot of ways but they're great 
They're they're yeah. like it's like low level. Uh, ro- it's not like they're shocking or you know they're just it's like a low level kind of literature except for they're fun stories and they lean against the female hero who doesn't need a man. You know that like yeah. they just lean against a lot of things that are that now it's hard to find things that have strong girl characters that aren't anti boy characters. Yeah, we actually were just talking about the the I strong female re- protagonist that released today. That up, yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Well, well, now that we're on this podcast, it didn't. Oh, has not released on your podcast. <laughs> no, what, what, I, what, I, oh, but yeah. what I mean is like you say it released today, but by the time this uh, releases, it was the last oh. episode or something. See, Who this knows? is what I struggle with every time I read sci fi novels. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. the, the strong, point how is, how a strong female protagonist doesn't have to be, it's not, it's not feminism. No, and in the Sherwood Ring, they had a the part of the thing that I enjoy about it is it's it's a there is a romance in it from a very strong and smart female character, and a and a guy who really likes her and is still trying to outsmart her. Like it's like a hilarious. It it is great because it doesn't it allows for a strong female character within the context of men enjoying that and yeah. not letting it dominate them either, not being intimidated by it. And it's just I like that. There we go. I think we've gone for a while. Yeah. I think we can uh, wrap it on up. Gone thanks, all the thanks way around the bend. Us. Thanks for having us on What Have You. Yeah. Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy to have you on uh, Stories or Soul Food. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, Perfect. Next I guess time, it'll we'll just have be you we'll release. We'll, we'll have you come get in we'll the car and give your the recipe tips. Bump on our podcast. Um, so, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll come do recipe tips. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. I'll talk to you about meatloaf. Housekeeping deets. Meatloaf. Yes. I don't think we've done it. What have you no, on meatloaf yet? So I remember you sending a lot about meatloaf. I did. That was and, me as and well. And I basically wrote home. What Which I, I never understood because it was amazing. Well, uh, when we drove, know, we drove by like a childhood friend's house and I pointed it out to my children as the place I first obeyed about meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was because I went to their house after school and they, and their mom made meatloaf and it was, Worst meatloaf than I'd ever seen in my life because it was topped off. We're turning this into a regular one. It was, to- it was topped off with American cheese. Oh, and- <laughs> okay. But somehow I knew in my heart that this was it. It was like, this is the time when you have to do it without a fuss. This is it, Rachel, because you can't do it here. You can't be the guest yeah. that won't do it. But I went home with so much pride. I was just so full of myself. I ate the meatloaf. Well, I'm getting it. a phone call from my heating contractor, which I need to take. So, <laughs> guys, we're done. All right. right. See, See you. Ya. Thanks See you later. Bye. Bye bye. And I missed it. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Stories or Soul Food podcast. <laughs>